Uh, did you know that 40 million Americans uh, suffer from a condition of anxiety? When I say condition, I don't mean simply nerves or just a rough little time, but a condition that needs treatment of some sort. The National Institute of Mental Health says that 31.1% of all Americans will at some point in their life experience an anxiety disorder. It's almost one third of this room that some type of anxiety disorder you will have in your lifetime. I'm a part of that 31%. I don't share this this morning to make the sermon about myself. Actually, a pet peeve of mine is when every preacher seems to have every lesson is about their life. You know what I'm talking about? But I'm a part of that 31%. And I share it because I know there are some people in this room who are struggling with their mental health who feel like no Christians understand or that they're absolutely alone. When I was 18, I was in some sin. I had no idea what I was doing with my future. I had some family problems we were still dealing with. And then an F5 tornado came through Moore, Oklahoma and destroyed grandma's house and stopped high school in its tracks. And this perfect storm came through and I developed anxiety disorders. I remember the first night I had a panic attack. I remember my heart pounding. I couldn't catch my breath. I remember sweating. I remember my mind racing. These what if questions were popping in my head and I, I didn't know how to answer them because I wasn't in the right frame or state of mind. And it was the scariest thing. For three nights in a row, it was just panic attack after panic attack. I remember thinking, if this is what adult life is going to be like, I don't want to go through this. I have anxiety disorders. I dropped out of college before I began. I, I lost touch with a lot of my friends. I was miserable. I was alone at home all the time. I was anxious. Now, thankfully, through God, mostly, through Christian counseling, through love of people, and through medication, I got better. I still struggle. I still have bad seasons. But I'm very surprised at where I am today compared to where I was 10 years ago. I say that for those of you in this room who are dealing with your own struggle. Just because there's times where it feels like you're drowning in anxiety, it won't always be that way. It doesn't always have to be that way. I appreciate Owen reading that passage. Jesus said, do not worry. Don't you wish it was that simple? I remember I came forward one Sunday for my anxiety, and I told everyone how I was so worried, and a lady came up to me afterwards and said, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> don't you wish it were that easy? But Jesus speaking to a Jewish audience, to a group of people in the Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew 6, he says, do not worry, but he gives them reasons they can put their faith in Him. He gives them illustrations, evidence that says, if there is any place you could put your faith and put your worries and where to bring it, it should be in Me. Did you notice some of the illustrations that Jesus gave there in that passage Owen read? He said, first, do not worry about what you will eat, drink, or wear. Aren't those necessities in life? We're pretty spoiled, aren't we, compared to most of the world what people worried about in their day is I have a family of five and I have to feed them tomorrow. Where's the food going to come from? And while people struggle today, I think a lot of what we worry about isn't a basic necessity, not all the time. But yet he says, consider the birds of the air. They can't do much for themselves, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I don't know about you, but every time I go to Walmart, it never seems like we're short of birds in our community. <laughs> They're everywhere. When I lived in Elk City, there was a sign that said, this is a bird sanctuary. It was next to the KFC. <laughs> I kid you not. We have plenty of birds. He says, are you not of more value than they? You are far more important to God, and yet God takes care of the birds. He mentions the lilies. They neither toil nor spin. The flowers that grow. They can't do much on their own. They rely on someone else to provide all of their needs, and yet... We have plenty of flowers, don't we? Is the grass not always covered, covering our earth at some point? He says, one day all of that will be thrown into the oven. In eternity, this earth will burn up. But yet, I clothe the grass. How much more does your heavenly Father, who knows you need them, for you who are more valuable, will He not take care of you? Will He not provide for you? He mentions the Gentiles. 
The Gentile people who at this time were not in his covenant, were not his covenant people. He says, they have all these needs and I provide for them. How much more will your father provide for you? For you parents out there, one of your biggest responsibilities with your kids is to provide, isn't it? And you love that child and you will make sure they have everything they need. You go beyond the limits to make sure it happens. And how much more will God, who is your father, provide for you? It can't add a single hour to your lifespan. He mentions a cubit in some versions. That's from your elbow to the top of your middle finger. He says you're not adding that much to your life by worrying. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Don't think about tomorrow. Don't you wish it was that easy? Can you imagine being Jesus for a moment? Your entire life, you know what your purpose is. Your entire life, you know you're going to die. We all know that in this room. But yet he knows how. He knows when. And every day he takes a step closer to his purpose, to his hour. Every day he knows he's getting closer to the most excruciating 24 hours of his life, the most painful part of his life. Would you not be crippled with anxiety? I can't help but imagine how stressful it already was to be Jesus, surrounded by people, having all of this pressure, all of these expectations. The stress of eternity weighs upon your life to know what is coming. I would be frozen. But yet Jesus handles his anxiety incredibly. When I say anxiety, I don't mean sinful anxiety. There are times our anxiety might be a lack of faith, that we don't put our trust in Jesus. He says, oh, you of little faith. God wants us when we have this worry in our life to, to hand it to him to do all that we can, but then give it to him and let him have it. But sometimes we struggle and hold on to it for dear life. Sometimes our worry comes from spur of the moment, incredibly overwhelming events in our life that just hit us like waves in the ocean. Sometimes it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. But yet worry comes because it's a natural human emotion. And Jesus being God but being man knows what worry is like. This morning, what I would like to do in our time is look at a passage where I think we see Jesus and the overwhelming feeling of anxiety that happens in his life. And I want to look at four responses he has to his anxiety, four little practical tips we can use in our life when anxiety hits uh, that we see in this passage, but also in the Gospels at large. Listen, God is powerful and he is in control. Anxiety is is a struggle to have control. Don't we wish we had control over life and its situations? But control in our life is an illusion because we have oh so little. And to be honest, I don't know if we want control of our lives. I think we'd mess it up a lot more than an omnipotent, all-powerful God. But yet, we see Jesus dealing with this rush of human emotions. And I want to look at how he responded to it. If you have your Bible, look at Matthew chapter 26. As we read verses 36 through 46 this morning, there's going to be four practical tips, four things that we see Jesus doing, four ways he responded that we can respond in our own life. First, let's read this passage together in Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over, here, go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again for the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. 
Rise, let us going. See my betrayer is at hand. Before we get into the tips, one thing to note is that in Luke's account of this scene, it tells us that Jesus is sweating drops of blood. It's a medical condition called hematridosis, if I'm saying that correctly. It's caused by severe or excessive mental or physical anguish. And what happens is you have such a rush of adrenaline in your body, it goes up those fight or flight sensors in your brain, and it's such an extreme amount that it hemorrhages the blood vessels, and it causes your sweat drops to look like you're bleeding. He's not enduring at this moment any physical pain. So why does he have that condition? It's because he's going through the human emotion that we experience of anxiety. But notice some of the tips or the ways he responds. First, this morning, notice how Jesus didn't run from his anxiety. Jesus didn't run from his anxiety. Our anxiety triggers our fight or flight sensor. It's this rush of adrenaline. It comes in your brain like a highway, and there are two exits. I can fight or I can flee. Think about when your wife finds a spider. She typically responds with flight. You hear the scream. And then, husband, what are you called to do? It's my job to respond with fight. Let me kill it. That might be most. If you're the male who is afraid of the spider, you don't have to admit that this morning. No one's going to make you come forward and say that. (laughs) Think of elementary school. When a bully picked on you or someone maybe wanted to fight you, there's that rush of adrenaline and I can do what? I can fight back, I can square up, or I can run away, go to a teacher, just run for dear life as fast as I can. What's remarkable about Jesus is that he knows what's coming very quickly and he does neither. He doesn't run from it, but he also doesn't physically fight back. The Bible tells us he has the power and ability to do both. What would happen very shortly after this passage, when Judas comes to betray him with a kiss and the guards are there and they go to arrest Jesus, do you remember what Peter does? He pulls out the sword and he chooses to cut Malchus' ear. Do you remember how Jesus responded? He said, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Jesus had the power to fight back. We sing that old classic church hymn of he could have called 10,000 angels. He had the power to fight, yet he chose not to. He He chose restraint. Yet he could have ran away. He could have took flight. Maybe literally. I mean, we have a God who is miraculous in power. He's walked on water. He's done many great signs and wonders. He could have gotten away. Yet he chose to sit in his anxiety. He chose to sit in an uncomfortable situation. Jesus did not run from his anxiety because he knew the only way to fulfill God's plan was to endure what is coming. The only way that you and I can be saved from sin, to save mankind, is to sit and endure this moment. I think there is is a principle for us in our anxiety, to never run from our anxiety. Running away from anxiety doesn't fix it. There's biblical precedence for getting out of a confrontation or from removing yourself from a situation. I know that. But in most cases in our life, running away from our problems doesn't actually solve the problem. Have you ever ran away from a worry in your life only for it to find you again? Maybe you're in conflict in your home with your spouse, with a child, with a parent, however it may be. And I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to handle this. It's causing me all these emotions, so I get away. But what happens eventually when you come back? Do I not have to handle the situation? It's like I can avoid it at all costs, but eventually at some point, I have to deal with this. Have you ever been caught up in sin? And you just try to run away from it, only for that same habit to find you again. Think about a teenager and your homework. Have you ever had so much homework, teenagers, that you're absolutely stressed to your eyeballs about how am I going to get all this done? And then what do we do as smart people? We procrastinate. But what happens when I'm done playing my video game or I'm done watching a movie and I come back? I am anxious all over again. We sometimes try to run from our problems and run from our anxiety, and yet that's not how Jesus responded. Because he knew sometimes the best way is to sit in it and to deal with what's coming. He moved forward, step by step, facing his purpose. And for us, when we choose to sit in our anxiety, to sit in that gray, that uncomfortable, 
we can deal with the problems that might be causing our anxiety. I know our worry doesn't always come from specific causes we know, but how often in life are we anxious because of issues we know of and we are just not wanting to deal with them? Don't run away from the things that cause you anxiety. Instead, face them and grow from them. Why this might be important is that the Christian life is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. Losing your life for Jesus' sake is not comfortable. Think of all the actions God calls for us to be a part of that are uncomfortable. Rebuking a brother. Comfortable? Telling a hard truth to a lost soul. Is that comfortable? I think about our brothers who've led singing for the first time the last couple weeks. Hasn't that been awesome? Is that comfortable? Getting to sing for the first time in front of people? God calls us to do so many uncomfortable actions, but when we get in the habit of running from everything that makes us uncomfortable, we train our minds to avoid situations that God might want us to go through and to act in. Jesus never ran from his anxiety. He dealt with what was coming. He didn't choose just to flee it at all costs. And for us, I think there's truth for that in our lives. When there are issues that are causing our anxiety, instead of fleeing from it all the time, maybe we should turn and face it. That's practical tip number one here. He chose to sit in his anxiety and deal with it. But then secondly this morning, Jesus stayed active. Jesus stayed active. The worst game that I ever played on a playground growing up was freeze tag. Have you ever played it? Or there's one child who's it, and he runs around tagging people, and when he tags you, you're frozen, and you just stand there. I hated that game because there's never a winner. You can, which, parents, that's a great game to teach your children when you need them to waste time. <laughs> but there's never a winner. You play forever. Because someone comes around, they untag their partner, and now they're unfrozen. And I hated to be it. I hated that there was no winner. But if there's any winner of freeze tag, it's anxiety. Because it's going around hitting people, and it cripples us, doesn't it? You get touched by it, and it just stops you in your tracks. When it comes to Jesus, what's remarkable is that despite knowing everything he knew in his ministry and in his life, does he ever seem frozen to you in the Gospels? No, he knew what was coming multiple times in the Gospel of John. You hear about this phrase called, my hour. He even mentions it here about the hour is here. Like John 12, 27 Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. John 13, 1. Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father. John 17, 1. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. He knew what was coming, and yet he never seems frozen by it. And one principle we might find in his life in the Gospels, and even he, as he go, here, as he goes further away multiple times, is that he stayed active. He stayed active. We find a God who seems to be going from place to place, serving in ways that he could during his life. He takes time to rest. That's important. Not discounting rest. He takes time to get away and decompress. We find Jesus going to mountaintops in solitude. We find Jesus in solitude walking on water, spending time with his Father in prayer. But what we never find with God is that he stayed in one place being inactive for too long. What do we do when we're overwhelmed with anxiety? I like to stay in my bed. And I sit in a room and I see the same four walls forever. Anyone else like that? It's actually not very helpful. While rest is important, while getting away is important, when you stay in one spot and you are inactive, what you're actually doing is causing your anxiety to almost be like a snowball coming down the top of a mountain. It's just growing in speed and size. You must stay active. I think there's certain ways we need to be moving when we're anxious. Number one, we need to move to solve the problem causing our anxiety. If there is a specific thing in our life causing anxiety, we should move towards it to address it. If it's a sin... Instead of running from our sin, let's confess it, let's address it, let's try to get a handle on it, let's talk to someone else about it, not run from it. If it's confrontation, we should move to resolve the confrontation as best we can. We should be moving. There's even a principle here of being physically active. It's harder for you to be overwhelmed with anxiety and panic when you've spent energy physically working. 
It's true in medical term, or it's it's true in medicine. Uh, it's harder for me if I've ran miles, if I've walked miles, if I've lifted weights, if I've played a sport, if I've been working around around the house. It's harder when, when anxiety hits for it to overload my system because I've already exerted the physical energy doing something that day. So we need to be staying active. Jesus kept moving. And I wonder if part of that was not only to serve his purpose and work for God, but it helped him not always be thinking about what was coming 24-7 and to not be overwhelmed and look at it like we might. So tip number two this morning is we find a Jesus who goes further away and further away he stayed active. He kept moving. Third, he used his support system. You find that he takes three of his disciples with him, the sons of Zebedee. You see, you see Peter there. They, he has a support system that he uses. As people, we tend to be filled with pride. I don't want anyone to know that I have a struggle. I don't want people to know I have sin. I don't want them to know my problems. I'd rather have a fake smile, put on a strong face, spend an hour in here faking it, than have anybody know that I have problems. Yet the most powerful being to ever walk the planet, the strongest person to ever exist, wasn't too big to say, hey, can you come be with me? If Jesus needed people in his life, don't we? Hey, come be with me for a while. He takes them to come pray with them. And I, I wonder, what did Jesus want from his disciples in this moment? What did he expect from them? First, I think he wanted their presence. Would you just come be with me? He says, come with me, be with me. He wanted people near him. In our overwhelming seasons of life, don't we want the same? We should. But secondly, I think he wanted their attention. In our social media world where we're always on this, I don't want to tell you my screen time this week, okay? But we have a problem with sometimes we are present physically, but we're not present mentally. Have you ever been there with somebody? Like, hey, are you there? Jesus said, hey, I want you here with me, but I, I also think he wanted their attention. He wanted their comfort, and that comes in a variety of possible ways, but would you pray with me? Would you provide comfort to me in this situation? It might be this morning that you don't struggle with anxiety, or you have worries, but they're not overwhelming in your life. Maybe for you, the lesson is about being a better support system for the people in your life. Are you present? Are you mentally present? Do you provide a comfort in that situation? I remember being in college and missing school some because of panic attacks. And I had a classmate who became my teacher, who became an instructor at Bear Valley. I, he was really good. That's how that happens, I guess. But he came to my apartment. He sat in my living room and he said, I have no idea what to say to you. I can't fix it. I wish I could. He said, so I don't know what to say, but I love you, and I'll listen to whatever you want to tell me, and can I pray with you? That's being a support system. That meant the world to me. That's the kind of people we need to be for one another. If God says we should bear one, another, one another's burdens, if he says we should encourage one another as the day draws near, that we should be comforting to one another, then we need to be the right kind of support system, and we need to be involved in each other's lives. Are you using the people God has blessed you with as a support for your problems? Or are you trying to fight them all by yourself? Or are you being the support system that someone else needs you to be to lift their burden from being theirs alone? A last tip for you. Number four. Jesus practiced personal prayer. Have you ever heard those sermons where the answer to everything is read your Bible and pray? Just pray about it. It'll fix it. That ever frustrates you sometimes? Reading your Bible and praying is absolutely good in every situation of your life. But sometimes it's, well, how do I pray? And what am I supposed to read? And how do we do this? Notice how Jesus prayed in this passage. Do you see it? It's not very long. I had a grandma who used to say, uh, prayer doesn't have to last forever for it to be everlasting. A lot of application there. But yet here he prays. And if God in the most overwhelming moment of his human life prays, that says something about the power of prayer in our life. Notice number one, he, he prayed purposefully. Jesus didn't say, dear God, thank you for the food I ate today. And thank you for the card Sister Su Susie sent me in the mail. And the weather is beautiful right now. No, he said, Father, I have an urgent issue on my heart. And that's what I'm speaking to you about. 
Notice he prayed personally. Father, let this cup pass from me. What Jesus is essentially saying is, I do not want to go through what I'm about to go through. If there is any other way besides a cross and nails in my body, being flogged, having my flesh ripped apart, a crown of thorns upon my head, can we have that option? But if it's the only way, God, for you and for them, I will do it. Is that not personal? Is that not brutally honest? God wants to hear how we feel. Yes, it is God, a holy God. He deserves our respect. But God wants us to, wants to hear our emotions. He wants to know how we're really feeling, what's, what's on our brain. And Jesus prays personally in this time. But notice he also prays persistently. Three times he goes and he prays. And maybe the part of our prayer life that we struggle with the most is, I'm dealing with something, I pray, and then I stop. Well, it didn't get any better. But yet consistently he goes over and over again to God, telling him what's going on in his life. Over and over again, asking and giving his request to God. Prayer, when done consistently, and even spur of the moment times or random times, it has a great physical benefit for you. It's a relief. But even more so, it'll grow you spiritually. I used to wonder why I prayed when I had panic attacks. But what would happen is when my anxiety ceased and I felt better, I'd look back on the fact that I prayed and thought, God hears and he answers. And it actually grew my faith and made me want to pray more. Even when it makes no sense to you pray, it will grow your faith in retrospect, in hindsight. Here Jesus practices personal prayer. Three Ps to it, purposefully, personally, persistently, and we should do the same. In those overwhelming moments of life, go to your father. He wants to hear it. You're valuable to him. Those are four practical tips that we can see in Jesus' life in multiple times in the Gospels of how he dealt with the overwhelming moments that came to him. And I hope this morning that one of those resonates with you. They're not every piece of advice. They're not every tip you can use. But I just wanted to give you something practical this morning that might help you. I want to close with this verse that we didn't really comment that Owen read to us a moment ago. At the end of the section on anxiety is this verse we quote all the time, and I wonder if we understand the context of it. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You're so worried about everything in your life, but he says, how about you just worry about being right with God about being righteous, about seeking his kingdom, being his kingdom people, and let me worry about the rest. Let, God says, let me handle the rest. In my life, there's a lot of things I've tried to help with my anxiety, but there is one part of my life that no medication, no counselor, no therapy could ever help, and it's the problem of sin. Because there is only one person that can take your anxiety away from your sin, and it's Jesus there is only one place you can find, go to and be in that removes the worry from your life, and that's in Christ. And if we're walking around not in Christ, if we're walking around living in sin, there is nothing I believe we can say to really help except for let's address that sin. If, if this morning you're here in attendance or you're watching at home and you have never made yourself right with God, it's understandable that you're anxious. And anxiety in that way is a good thing because it's warning you that you need to do something. And this morning, we would love to help you get right with God so we can take that fear away. But also this morning, it might be that you are in Christ, but you are absolutely overwhelmed in your life, frozen and crippled by anxiety. We don't have all the answers, but we love you and you're not alone. And we would love to hug your neck and to pray with you and say, hey, we care. We might not get it, but we care. We are going to deal with anxiety in our lives, but we don't have to drown in it if we're with Jesus in this life, if we follow him. And so this morning, if you have a need, we would love to help you right now as we come forward and as we stand and as we sing.